Hey, good morning. It's time to trade some Forex. Let's go. Jim, hey, you're always the first one every single day. Thank you for awesome discipline. Hey, let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. And welcome, everybody, to the Forex.today YouTube channel. Uh, please remember to subscribe. Please remember to like. Please remember to comment. If you'd like a copy of my chart templates, they are in the uh, YouTube video description below. Absolutely free. Compliments of the firm. Please enjoy. Jean-Guy, good morning to you, sir. So good morning. My name is Wayne McDonald. I am the chief FX market strategist for TradersWay.com. We're a boutique foreign exchange trading firm. We would like to earn your respect your loyalty, and your business. And one way of doing that is offering you these webinars every single morning, helping you set up technical trade plans, helping you discern the fundamentals, help you deal with trader psychology. And when you're ready to trade real money or start your foreign exchange trading business, would you please consider tradersway.com? Go there now. You can open up a demo account, test the execution speed, check out the, uh, the competitive spreads. You already got world-class customer service, so stop on by. Give us an opportunity. We want to earn your business. So good morning. One of the things we talked about recently, like yesterday, we talked about discipline right patience and discipline are core values that you need to have if you want to become a, a successful forex trader probably any type of trader but specifically forex for shell so let's give an example of that let's say you're trading extremely important high volatility news in front of 600 people and during this moment, the markets are dropping like a ton of bricks. It looks like the world is ending just red, 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 red. What do you do if you're a bull? Do you start chasing red candles or do you set up trade plans based on your long-term bias? And of course, your analysis of the result of the, the actual news that took place. Well, yesterday I was in a very similar situation. <laughs> You're like, wait, exact, the exact thing. And I had a uh, plan A or plan B. Huh. The whole time talking about patience, talking about discipline, talking about sticking with a plan and planning your trades. If you're a bull, find the next two levels of support in which you will look for reversal patterns. And why would I be a bull? And we discussed what the fundamentals meant, what it meant for GDP to be revised down, for CPI to be revised down. Is that bullish? Is it bearish? All this kind of stuff. Put it into a trade plan. Plan A, oops, where's my mouse? Plan A is, you know, hey, look for a reversal pattern here. Did one occur? No. How about in here? Yeah. Yeah, so that one worked. That's, your, that's how you trade, right? That, or that's how you should trade, right? I mean, isn't that it right there? 
How should one be one? How should one behave in incredibly volatile markets? Calmly, with focus, with patience, and with discipline. But that sounds like every boring day, right? Am I right, Gino? Eh? Yeah, good, good job, Nikki. Any thoughts about that? No? Everyone's good? Like, that's really? I thought that was impressive. Sure would have been easy to just chase those candles. So, so, so! Look, I guess it's red! So, so, so! Hmm. Okay. Tough crowd this morning. What's going on? Calmly with focus with discipline. Wrote that down. Cool. Right on. Michael, why, why didn't you get it? I sent it to everyone that downloaded it the first time. Yeah, you know, just Michael, just wait, just look, um, I was able to defer my final examination uh, till about noon today. Um, and I thought that was a good idea, even though I studied, you know, here's, here's my lecture notes. Um, uh, yeah, I only slept like three hours yesterday. Yeah, the, like the night before our webinar and the night before I did the two hour FOMC meeting. So I spoke for four hours plus some other meetings mean and tried to study. And that whole time I only had slept maybe three hours that day because I was up doing some trading. And so, so anyways, long story short, I had the opportunity to defer till today to take my exam. I thought, you know what? I should probably get some sleep. So I took that. So let me get through this, Mikey, and um, I, I will, yeah, I will send that for you, okay? I've already sent it to everyone, but for some reason, I guess I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll update the site. Okay, so anyways. I don't know, maybe you put a fake email address, Mike. I don't know. <clears throat> Don't know. Anyways, uh, is it possible to have uh, this news have any effect on you? Well, well, Rob. So, did you, um, did you watch the BOJ meeting yesterday? The Bank of Japan. They also had their meeting. Oh, thank you, Nikki. Nickster. Yeah. No, nobody watched the Bank of Japan Central Bank meeting yesterday. You watched the Fed, but you skipped. You skipped the BOJ, huh? Hmm. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. Um, so maybe uh, maybe do some research today on that. Um, last week, we got the, the Bank of England, right? Is, is that now? I mean, I'm sorry. Like, like I said, I decided to get eight hours sleep. Um. So, you know, I've only been awake an hour, um, so I haven't had an opportunity to do deep research and all that. <laughs> I'm a little off, having studied and stuff, I'm a little offline. So, yeah, we got we got the big old uh, BOE, don't we? Like now, like right now, like it's happening now kind of thing. Maybe we should be watching the pound. Um, but, yeah, so BOJ was yesterday, BOE today, Fed yesterday. Do I look crappy? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think so too. My hair looks really dry and stuff, but. All right, so anyways, uh, BOE today, right? So uh, anyways, um, so we got to keep an eye on that. Just note, note some basics, right? Like forget about the news part. You can't control that. And you can't control how people are going to freak out and respond to news. Just like yesterday's um, Fed meeting, it was going down. And the whole time I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense whatsoever. That makes no sense. But people were freaking out, right? So what did make sense? Well, it was supposed to go up, so find some support. And sure, look, it went up. Yeah, well, we were not idiots freaking out. So how do you not how how do you not be get you know get sucked into the vortex of mediocrity? Um, well, you do your work first, right? So I look at this and I say to myself, well, no matter what happens to the pound, <clears throat> I ain't buying it here. In this case, euro pound would go down. Uh, uh, well, if euro pound goes up, which means pound is weak, I ain't buying euro pound here. No matter what happens. Right? No matter what happens, Marion, don't look at the ark. <laughs> like, no matter what happens, uh, this is the only thing I could even consider. No matter what. Okay? And even then, yeah, right? So just try to simplify what's going on so that you, you don't get sucked into um, the volatile vortex of mediocrity, right? Now, what about selling Kiwi here? Much different scenario, right? Do you, By the way, do you like my setup here? That's pretty, isn't it? Yeah, you're welcome. So now... One might stink that this would act as support, right? Whoa. Something like that, maybe? Good morning. Thailand. What do you think? Here's the interesting. Remember when you didn't know pivot points? Remember when this would have been just like a curious, a curious little thing like, hmm, I wonder why it reversed there. It's beautiful, right? Like, look at that. Just what a nice little weekly top. Yeah. So here's the thing. Remember, like, especially last week and maybe even the week before, there were a lot of times when I'd look at a chart that's a mediocre, and I'd go to the next one, mediocre, next one, no clear trend, middle of the range, mediocre, right? All this kind of stuff. Are you getting to the point where you're going through your charts, you know, um, subjectively evaluating, right? And trying to look for things that are better quality setups. See, my, my concern now is actually on this one. What will probably happen is something like this. But this is holiday week, right? So who knows what happens there. But our job is to be analysts first. I don't know if you think that way. Okay. Analyst first. You have to analyze the market. Is this a market worth investing into? Is that right? You seem to be doing more plan A, plan B. Yeah, but it, it feels so much better, right? If you're waiting for things to set up, it just feels like you're in control or more in control, right?
Is it in two weeks? No, no. What? It's the 19th or something today, or the 20th, right? No. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, I mean, trading is trading. Right? It says I'm trading stocks, but it influences the way I trade. Well, trading is trading. Um, I, I sort of individually buy stocks. Um, the last the last stock I've purchased, like when I called up um, my wealth manager, I'm like, hey, buddy, uh, I want you to buy some Bank of America stock. I want you to pick up some shares at five bucks. That was the last phone call I ever made to him. <laughs> Buy Bank of America at five bucks. So we did, but Bank of America stock at five bucks. Um, not, not much before that, um, I had sold my Apple shares. And I had bought Apple at $6 a share. Yeah, no shit. I own Apple shares at $6. <laughs> True story. Uh, true story. So um, I don't trade stock a lot. But uh, as far as like stock indices, you know, my... I've traded stock indices, commodity futures, uh, financial futures like, uh, let's say, 10-year T-note. Um, VIX is more of a fundamental play. VIX is nice. Like, VIX is a gift every once in a while. It's so clearly, obviously going to do something. I mean, it's just a gift. Uh, I wouldn't trade it every day, but there are certain... There's a certain seasonality to everything that every once in a while it's just a gift. Like, like, like going back to the Apple shares. Did you know this? Like, there was a time, and I, I, I don't know if it's true now, but like 30 years ago, they did something called Mac World or, 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 or something like that. It was in uh, February, I think. And Steve Jobs would, uh, and there was actually a time when Steve Jobs wasn't even around. They'd do Mac World, but they would come out with a new product and they would announce it, right? So it was like you could buy Apple shares like in August, I think it was. And then school sales would pick up. Remember, people bought Apple computers for their kids. It was a kid's computer, right? So uh, so anyways, they bought, you'd buy them on iMac and they'd go off and, and do school. So sales would take off and then you had Christmas. So the shares would follow sort of like a Santa Claus rally because Apple would benefit from uh, back to school sales and it would benefit from Christmas sales. And then people, you know, articles in all the magazines would start to be printed because this, this is even before blogging that they would, there's a new announcement coming up, a new Apple product is coming, a new Apple product's coming, right? That kind of stuff. And then it would, and then they would announce it at Macworld and the stock would tank. Because it was already priced in, and it was like a gift. <laughs> just buy it in September, or buy it in uh, August, and get out in March, and you were fine. So, uh, so anyways, uh, what else? Uh, like oil and gold for sure. I don't trade silver, but when Dave, David Pegler worked for me, he trade silver. Um, what else besides forex that I can think of? I think that's probably it. Yeah, that's probably it. You'll be fine. So individual stocks, yeah, probably. But I I think for this to work, you're going to need um, volume. You're going to need, right, you need a million traders doing the same thing at the same time. So a stock indices, yeah, probably. Some random dogfood.com stock, less likely is all I'm thinking. Pork bellies, yeah, bacon. So, so anyways, I, I hope you're going through your charts looking for investments. I want you to think like an analyst first, and then really an investor. Like, would you recommend this to someone with a lot of money that they should buy it? 
Or are you just throwing down a trade because, because it's just another trade? Well, you know what I mean? What is it that you truly are doing? I've, re I've recommended in the past that you guys think like billionaires. And I think it was two summers ago, I asked people to volunteer to write a trade uh, strategy as if they received a billion dollars, how, what portfolio would you build? And that means you'd have to have a, a, a six month, 12 month and a two year fundamental outlook for just the, you know, the market for systemic reasons. And then how would you, you know, how much would you put into bonds? How much would you put into Forex? How much would you put into stock indices and all that kind of stuff? And how would you, how much would you have for real estate and alternatives and stuff? And just really construct this and then sort of carry that out, right? Just thinking bigger gets you out of amateur mode, right? Yeah, Michael, but use the data from uh, Trader's Way, huh? So, uh, so anyway, so looking at some of these th stuff, are we near the top or are we near the bottom? It's not that complicated type of information, right? Um, where are we going? What's the next step? What's happening? What are, are people getting into this market or getting out of this market? This doesn't seem like a lot of activity is going on, right? Well, we're, we're waiting for the meeting, but, but nonetheless, right? Are you a buyer of this? Are you heading up to here? Or are you heading down to here? Well, a swing trader bought this on Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. It's Thursday, right? Someone on Sunday bought this as a bull. They justified it like an inverse head and shoulders type scenario. And their target is here. So they're going to take profit here or here. We don't know which one. But that was the plan on Sunday. Now, there used to be a time when you didn't trade with a plan. And there was a time when you didn't look into the future. You always just looked in the past. Now, things have changed, right? Oh, is that right? Well, it, you know, retail sales are really good, but put it this way, guys. I, I want you to, you know, all joking aside and stuff, I want you to start really, truly planning your trades, okay? This was the projected bottom for the month of December. Another way of saying it is it's not supposed to fall farther than that. Now, it totally could, of course, but as an analyst, you'd say this is supposed to be the bottom, Okay. Then that's followed up by a higher high. What am I supposed to do now? What's the next part of the thought process as an analyst? Just with this information. Hmm? Just want to know you know that you're on top of basic um, technicals. High or low, yes, but right, LaSalle Day says confirm high or low. Actually, yeah, but it's not that you confirm the higher low, you anticipate the higher low. Okay? Another way of saying it with the secret word is hammock. Thank you, Raymond. Raymond is actually 100% correct. So you're already thinking this down here, guys. When you're still up here, when you recognize the higher high, you're like, aha. So in this scenario, guys, you're still here. And you say to yourself, ah, ah, hammock. Then you look left. 
you drag it across and you're like, yeah, somewhere around here. It's not precise, but think of it like a Fibonacci retracement where you measure from here to the top. What is this? 382, 50 percent, 618, 786, 100 percent. OK, so anyways. Then your whole trade plan now is something like this, right? Now let's go to Sunday morning. So you're thinking you're going to be a bull this week. Then you go Sunday morning when the market opens and we are uh, here, right? This move here. Okay. Actually it opened here and then dropped and then went back up. Okay. This based on swing trading is your entry somewhere in there. You say on Sunday morning, you want to buy and you spent the first four hours in this whole zone. You already knew here on Thursday that you wanted to buy. So your choice was you could buy it on Friday or you can buy it on Sunday. Okay. Now, it all seems easy in the past, right? What I'm trying to tell you is it's just a plan. And it affects what's happening today. All right. Now, there's a war going on in here for sure. Well, there's there's resistance. OK. And, you know, a pound is not that great. OK. There's a war going on here, but you're not supposed to be in here with your bayonet. In my book, I call it, you know, that you should be a sniper. Isn't it nice to be way down here attacking this line here, the, this resistance? Isn't it nice to be a sniper way down here? And someone else is doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat up here. That's the way I look at it. So all I know is, right, I need to remove risk now because we are, if this fails, it's going to fail here. As you can see, I have a bearish trade plan. If you're a bear, this has to hold here. Like, oh my gosh, if this doesn't hold here, you don't have resistance for a while, right? So we know bears where their entry is going to be. And by the way, on Sunday morning, we knew this line here is where bears were going to sell. Okay. So think of it this way, Sunday morning, Bulls are buyers here, bears would be sellers here, and who cares what everyone else does? Everyone else just isn't trading properly, right? And that's how I want you to start thinking about things. How can you stack this move, right? Well, that was the bullish swing. We don't know if it's going to be right, but you know what? If you really want to be like, if you want to be the world's greatest trader, I'm not saying that's possible, but let's say the world's greatest traders here. They've sold right at this bottom, right? And now their stop is here. They're risking, I don't know, 10 pips. But they also sold here, right? The This drop, the lower high, they sold here and their stop is pretty close too. And they're long and they're short. One of them is going to make 50 pips. One of these is going to lose 10 pips. And there's going to be a 40 pip win no matter what happens. But the 40 pips, but if it trends, it could be 400 pips. Depending on the direction of the trend, right? Not saying you should do that, but another way of looking at it is bears sold where bears are supposed to sell at resistance. Bulls bought where bulls were supposed to buy at support. One of them is going to work. But both, you know, are working. So like, let's say in an hour, price is down here. Do you understand if you took both sides of this trade, both trades would be bullish, right? Both sides are uh, not bullish, uh, profitable. So you're like, so, so, so what's going on with the pound dollar? You're like, well, I'm long and I'm short and I'm profitable in both trades. 
Michael, nobody gives a dang about your stops. What do you mean, hunting your stops? Look. Okay? We know bulls are by... There's like, you buy here, you sell there. Don't make a big thing about what? Wh who, who's hunting your stops? Or anyone's stops? Like, you, you mean... I don't know. Whatever. Just put it this way. Maybe it happens... I mean, there's there's so many market participants, right? But it's like, it's not as important as in, let, let's say, trading uh, a stock, okay? A stock is much more illiquid compared to currencies. Currencies are liquid by definition. So why do you need to hunt people's stops if you want into a trade? Like, put it this way. If you own dogfood.com and you wanted to get out of the trade, you need to get people to want to buy it from you. Right? Oh, yeah, U UK Kenny, yeah. But then, UK Kenny, um, then really nothing happened. You can move your stop here and move your stop here. And then, but the thing is, you're not going to lose money. Okay. So anyways, going back to the stop hunter thing, if, if you, <clears throat> if you needed to sell a stock, you need to convince someone to buy the stock from you, especially if it's illiquid, right? So like, and imagine now you're, you're truly a big hedge fund and you got to dump like a lot of, you know, like you have a huge block of shares you need to dump, but the market isn't that happy with the stock Let, let's say the stock's falling and you want to sell but nobody's buying right so you need to find a way to kind of get people to buy and all that kind of stuff and by shooting for certain prices where you know there's going to be support or resistance if you break through you're going to trigger and get bounces or rejections which maybe on the short term is favorable for you right now you, so you're trying to change market conditions so um, so, for example, a classic pump and dump. You want to sell your dogfood.com stock, and, and, and things are not good right now. No, there's not there's not many buyers, but you got to sell, and you got to sell a lot. So, what you can do is you can go into the futures market because futures are leveraged forty to one. Okay, so one million dollars will control forty million dollars, and you start using that to manipulate the market. Now, in, in particular, you could do this at the market open. Okay, so the market opens, ding, 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 and imagine now. I mean, if if you're a bill, if you're a billion dollar fund, a million dollars is nothing, right? And that controls forty million in shares, but ten million is nothing as well, and four hundred million, right? Like, so you could put in, you know, buy thirty million, and you're you're controlling over a billion, right? And just for the short term, you buy the S and P five hundred futures right at the open Ciao. and you help create a big green candle and of course now all the dumb money goes oh my god a big open a big open woo the bullish that's going to be a bullish day right and there's a feeding frenzy now sort of for everything because on cnbc and bloomberg and all the other channels around the world they're showing a strong open ding 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 buyers buyers green across the board so dumb money comes in and they're like, oh, I guess I'll buy some dogfood.com stock. The stock now. Okay, so two things happen. The hedge fund that, that just put 1.2 million in futures cash into the market to create the green candle suddenly sells part of their block as much as they possibly can into the dogfood.com feeding frenzy of chummed waters and sharks everywhere, right? So they dump all this dogfood.com stock onto the feeding frenzy until no one's willing to buy anymore. So they're, they're, right, prices start heading back down. They stop that, but guess what? Here's the beautiful thing about this. What was the feeding frenzy created with? Well, they they bought $1.2 billion in, in, in S&P 500 futures to get the market to open up and the market opened up. So now they dump the S&P 500 futures um, uh, contracts at a profit. 
And they dumped their dogfood.com stock on a bunch of people that were just reacting to an open. So they took, they probably made a, a hundred million bucks profit dumping their dogfood.com stock on a bunch of idiots. And they made money on manipulating the open with their leveraged futures. So they got, they double dipped. Beautiful. Right? Right? So is that necessary in Forex? Do, are people truly hunting your stops? Not in a scenario like this. Okay, if we were, you know, at double bottoms and double tops of key areas, you know, maybe, but it's not the right way to make money. And if they are making money, it's to do something else. But it, out, there's so much liquidity and so many market participants, it, it just wouldn't be the, the smartest or, or let's say not the smartest, uh, the most efficient way of making money in this market. Okay, so to Michael, I think asked the the, the question. Don't don't even think that way. It, it's just not, it's not helpful. The, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories and stuff that I see from from traders that you know come our way, and I'm like, you know, just just turn it off. I want you to think about trading forex like working at a factory. You walk in, you know what time you're going to start. You check in. Put, you punch your time card, you sit down, and you start planning. And you should know the right times to be trading, right? Market open for Asia. Market open for London. Market open for New York, right? <clears throat> Market closed for London. Market closed for New York. Monday open for Asia. Or, or market open for Asia, okay? And you sit down, you do your job. And there is no market manipulation. There's so many market participants and there's so much um, liquidity. I mean, it's cash. We're actually trading cash. By definition, it is liquid. They're not futures contracts, right? Uh, so um, don't think that way. Just it, It's just not helpful. And, and you don't need that, right? No, Rick, I do not. That's why swing trading is something that I like because... You know, being in the New York time zone, uh, being up at two o'clock in the morning is a difficult thing, mostly on my family life. I mean, I used to do it all the time, um, but it's hard now that I have kids and stuff. So I've moved over to swing trading where, you know, I could work a couple hours a week and have everything planned and then a couple hours a day and have everything planned. But um, but I was up at two o'clock in the morning yesterday, you know, so sometimes, but every day, no. Not me. It's just very difficult, right? But uh, what can I do? Well, I can consistently be at my charts when the market opens for the week on Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Great. Um, Asia open, fantastic, right? Uh, New York open, great. London closed, great. And the other stuff I basically have to leave for swing trading. Oh, Rob, well. We don't need to talk about your girlfriend at 2 o'clock in the morning. You want to hear something? I can't believe this. This is a side topic. I had an electrician come out uh, like three days ago and look at a whole bunch of projects I want done. Right? Like, for example, right above my bed, I want these tiny little spotlights on each side. So if it's the middle of the night and I want to like read or something, which you know, I can turn that light on. It's, it's just stuff I see in hotels. I'm like, that's cool. So, you know, I want those little micro spotlights and stuff and he's doing it. so anyways my wife walks in and we're talking and all that and, and she, he meets her and all that okay great well as he's leaving she walks by again and she, she's like oh, hey you're all done he's like yeah i've got it all planned out 
Once I get those spotlights in your bedroom, you can set up the pole. Like, what did you just say? Did you just call my wife a stripper to her face in front of me? Like, I just couldn't believe it. So I said, yeah, but I chafe easy, right? So I make a joke, but, and then kick him out of my house, right? But like, what the, did you just say? No, I think you just said something stupid, stuck his foot in his mouth. You know, everyone's capable of doing that for a while. But like, oh my God, did you just tell my wife we should set up a stripper pole in the spotlight that he hopes to be install for me? Like, what the? F <laughs> and this guy was not just an electrician. He was a, hey, what, what, I wish I had his business card. He's like a lighting consultant or something. Like he's a, a licensed lighting director, consultant, idiot. And his bid was like unbelievably expensive, like 200% more than it should be. But like, no, you call my wife a stripper and you know, you don't get to come back. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. That, how terrible was that, huh? Yeah, I guess. So, wow. Anyways, no joke. No joke. Hey, my wife's pretty, but come on. Come on. Yeah, that was the other thing. Like, So we have pictures of our children in, in our bedroom, right? Or on the dressers and stuff. And he looks at them and he's like, hey, so where are your kids? Like, are you asking questions about, are, are you looking at my family pictures? Like, what? I'm like, they're at school. Like, I don't like that stuff. You don't bring up my kids like that. Like, what the, what the f Creep me out, man. No way. Not, that's the end of that. You don't bring up, I guess he's trying to be polite or something. Like, you should ask about my kids, but that's bull. You don't ask about my, you don't, you don't start picking up information as I show you around my house. Like, oh, he's got two kids. I don't know, I'll write that down. Hey, what time, what's your security password? What's your social security number? What's in these drawers? Like, there's a point, like, you just, I don't know. So he must have had some social problems, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like, you know, anyways, too much. Um, so we're down here, guys. We're down here now. Uh, what can we take from this? Uh, of course, we know I wanted this to go up. So that's our dirty little secret. I can't do anything about that. Uh, it's not that I wanted to go up, but I wanted it. I wanted this to hold. But boy, did this start wrong. This did create a lower low, but I think even... I, I think nine times out of ten, even though this is a lower low, I'm still gonna I'm still gonna have my bias take over. And I'm not saying it's the right thing. I'm just saying what what is the likely thing. And it's it it, it is a mistake um, to think like okay, despite the lower low, we're still above the M2, and I still want to be a bull. Um, nine times out of ten, I think I'm still gonna make the decision of like, well, why don't we see if it moves sideways breaks out, pulls back, and then, then you get the move, right? It's not the right thing. It, it, it's quite literally the wrong thing, but it's still something I'm probably going to do. Uh, and, 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 and it's probably what I did do. Now, on this other way, you know, oh, by the way, just to, to support my own nonsense, um, this is obviously going to influence me. Okay, so look. It made a higher high. What would Wayne do? Well, Wayne's going to look for this all day long. And I, I probably did. I probably had a plan A and plan B. I'm sure if you went back, you know, two weeks, that's what I was thinking. Because I, I know I don't have to go back two weeks in the videos and look because that's, that's how I think. It's trending. I'm going to plan A and plan B. That didn't work. So now what? Well, it may be around support. Then it went a little too low, but, you know, the weekly, and then, but, the monthly, and then you get this, and then, oh, okay. Now, reverse engineer this thing. Somehow you're a bear, okay? And I'm okay with that. Remember, 
I believe somewhere between D, December 1st and December 31st, yen pairs are going to come down. I typically don't think it's going to happen in the beginning of the month, though. And that's where this went wrong. But let's say your elf is better than mine. You're right, I'm wrong. Bears got, you know, beautiful setup here. Okay? And my own bias filtered that out. Now, you might say that's wrong, and it, maybe it was, but in the context of what you, you'll see in the next 10 years of your trading, day by day by day, if you analyze 10 years of your trading, what you'll see is, in this case, this filter basically cost me, but it's going to save me many, 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 many times throughout the trading history. And it'll, what it does is it ends up keeping you out of trades. In this case, it kept me out of a good trade. And so what you don't want to say is, oh, therefore you should not do it. Um, what you don't see here is the nine other bad trades that filter filters out. So I don't know if that helps uh, the reckoning. Maybe I'm just supporting my own ego so that I don't lose hope and give up and, 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 or lose my discipline, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, a, a, a downward yen move is fine with me. Um, but that going back, I would have really have hoped for a higher high and then bring us down. I want to be way up here on January 1st, not down here. Okay. That's all. So that's, that's how that happened. That's sort of like reliving the month. It's unfortunate. Okay. Here's that USD. Okay. You, you want to see it, right? Sunday morning. Remember every day I say, hey, Sunday morning. Or Sunday afternoon, 5 p.m. This is a bearish entry. And based on that, the conservative target is here. The aggressive target is here. Isn't that nice? Both worked out. Well, let's go back to Banda's question on the, what is it, uh, Aussie yen? Okay, your 200 EMA, what is this? Wayne, would you shay, would you, would you have used the 200 EMA moving average to give you your bias take that? Um, yeah, you know, it's hard, and especially in hindsight. Like, now it looks easy. But, again, I was filtering out reality. Um, maybe, and, and, and maybe not rightly. I'm, I'm okay to accept that I may have just been wrong, or I should have been more open-minded, or something, something. Okay? But pure technical analysis says that when you do dip below this stuff, that you return... Right? You return to the cluster. Okay? So, you know, here you, this is where you're, a, um, above this, you're, you're technically bullish. And these double resets, by the way, are clues that it's going to reverse. There's a lot of clues here that I've filtered out. Okay? And then, yeah, this turn, so now you're below the 50, uh, 21. You're below the 55. You're below the 200. Yeah, there's going to be a retracement, and then there's going to be a drop. Yes. Okay. Well, Kevin, maybe they're smarter than I am. Uh, maybe they've had better mentors. Remember, I didn't have a mentor. I'm self-taught. So I have a simpleton view of trading. I don't like complexity. 
Uh, when I was a venture capitalist, we looked at a lot of, uh, in this case, we, we invested into patents, not into companies per se, but we would take over patents and then build them, all right? Um, and so I looked at a lot of intellectual property and a lot of gadgets, things that were prototyped and stuff like that, or we would make the prototypes once we took over the patents. But nonetheless, we had all this intellectual property. And the one thing I learned as a venture capitalist was um, no matter how good the product is, the level of complexity, um, I guess for each level of complexity that it has, you have to discount it. So you might have a, a, a nuclear powered um, mouse trap that kills mice a hundred percent of the time. But there's two problems. You have to build a nuclear power plant <laughs> to power it, which is risky and expensive, right? And the other problem is no one wants to pay $2 million for it, right? So, um, so anyways, complex is bad in my mind. That's just sort of the, the baggage I bring with me. Um, the more complex it is, the more likely it's going to break. So I like simplicity. I like efficiency because it's reliable, right? So I don't measure all these angles and stuff. And you, and you have to remember, like being self-taught, um, how long does it take for someone to like create all these different things? And like this has to be 62 degrees of this, of this other thing that has to be 22 or 40. You know, um, I don't know. But I think if you look at what I do, there's a lot of um, – Elliot Wave in it, right? I think in many ways I figured out Elliot Wave, but I don't count waves because I'm an entrepreneur. I don't fit in that world. If I was an, an accountant, I'd probably love Elliot Wave. But I'm not. Right? So I asked myself, what are the market conditions? And when we were up here, I, I said they were up. Market conditions have changed. Okay. But that's, that's a big part of simply asking that, that question. Now, it seems pretty simple, but that's basically it. And then I tried to trend trade it. Now, the use of pivot points and price action was also very key to the way I trade because it helps me predict support and resistance in the future. Okay. Yeah. So there, the cycles and so uh, what else do I bring to the table when, when I started doing this? Uh, I'm a businessman first and foremost, so uh, I didn't grow up and my dad was a trader, so I became a trader too. Uh, I'm a businessman. Um, so I look at this as money and transactions, and therefore I know there's seasonality to, to business. There's also cycles to business. And then... On top of that, there's cycles in, in economics because of the cycles in business, right? So because of business cycles, you get like central banking policies. The banks have to interact with the business cycles. And because of the central banking cycles, then you get things like real estate cycles. And there's these super cycles on top of uh, normal cycles. And I think that's all really interesting. Uh, it doesn't put me in a trade today, but... You know, like expecting Japanese yen strength um, now is helpful, I think. And I get that from the understanding of like business cycles. Oh, Benda says, have you heard about GAN trading? Oh, yeah, but. I think GAN was a nutcase, so just be careful. Some people just get into the math, and they're so focused on the math that they have no common sense. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I, 
I get my trading boils down to common sense. There's a reason why money is flowing to Australia or away from Australia. There's a reason why money is flowing to Japan or away from Japan. And it's common sense. I, I don't want to focus on the complex math um, because after a while, you're so focused on the model. So, for example, I used to work at NASA. I wanted to be an astronaut. And in fact, I was preparing to become an astronaut. So that's why I worked at, at NASA. And I was a, an aviation research assistant focusing on heads up displays. And back in the um, back in like the early days of the Vietnam War, the Americans went and um, um, there were MIGs in, in the sky. Some of them were right. Well, they're all Russian MIGs, but flown by even Russians. Right. So anyways, um, so. Uh, the United States gets there, and they haven't really had a serious dogfight since World War II, right? Like, I, I don't think that really happened in, in Korea. So they get there, and the kill ratio is terrible. It's basically one for one. And it's a war of attrition. So you send a pilot up in a plane, he shoots a MiG down, but then he crashes, right? And so uh, he dies too, and everybody dies, and it's terrible. So they start things like Top Gun um, as a consequence, right? Um, and... and if you need, know the movie, that's where Top Gun School comes from. It's a school to teach fighter pilots how to dogfight, right? Well, but there was, there's sort of a, a, a period in there in between where one of the things that the, the Americans did to increase the kill ratios, they, they created, like, better technology. One, air-to-air, um, -air, you know, self-guiding um, heat-seeking missiles like a Sidewinder. Um, and then they in, invested in things like heads-up display. This was sort of to make the pilot a, a, a better at what they do. So anyway, so the Americans would go up, they would get up there, and they had better technology and some better flying skills. And all of a sudden, the kill ratio went from 1 to 1 to like 8 to 1, 9 to 1. And they, uh, they'd get up there and send out a sidewinder, splash that MIG, and then just move on like it was easy, right? Um, but then here's the problem. They would come down, they would land on a runway. Meanwhile, they're using their heads up display. And then they would do this. They would turn and they would like drive, drive. They're, they're taxiing. They'll taxi into a parked plane in front of them because they're looking at the heads up display. They're not looking through the, the windscreen. <laughs> And they would, like, drive into a parked airplane. And they're like, what? So what, what is this? They're so focused on the heads-up display, they don't see reality. Like, oh, my God, there's a parked plane, there's a parked plane, there's a parked plane. <laughs> Boom, hit the parked plane. When you get, like, the GAN stuff going, first of all, the guy, he was a nutcase. So I don't know. Um, but... Um, the, the, the grid, right? Here's a great one. Um, oh, did I not do it right? Okay. Anyway, so it looks really good. Oh, look, if I only use GAN. All right. Okay, great. Get, a, is a nice case, but B, you're going to get so caught up in trying to do the math that you don't even just see reality. Like the basic stuff. Like, you're at support, bro. You're at resistance, bro. <laughs> right? Like, um... Right. So I, I very quickly, because I did explore some of this stuff like 18 years ago. Um, and I just got rid of it all. I was a little bit curious with things like Fibonacci, like arcs and stuff. But I couldn't find any information about them. That was my other problem. There wasn't any information. I'd go to a bookstore and there was no books on this stuff. Like you would Google back then. It was even Yahoo, right? You, there weren't even search engines. And anyways, you would look to try like Fibonacci arcs and nothing came up. They're like It was just an enigma. So I got rid of all the complexity and I focused on what I knew well, common sense. Business cycles, right? Large and small. Seasonality. When does the farmer harvest? When does the farmer plant? Like, for example, one year I made a call on um, wheat. I said wheat prices were going to go up, so you might as well buy some wheat, uh, buy some wheat futures. 
grain futures. And why was that? Well, it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained, and rained um, one fall. Uh, no, uh, one spring, I think it was. Uh, it rained and rained, very wet. It was a cold winter, and then there was too much snow, and then it all melted, so all the fields were flooded, and then it rained and rained and rained. It was just a terrible, terrible, terrible spring. We got to a point where, um, I, I don't know what the date is, but there's a date in which you cannot buy insurance on your farm, for your farm, for your crop crop insurance. There's a cutoff date where it's just too late in the season to buy insurance because if you plant after that day, the likelihood your yields are going to be low is like 100%. So no one's going to insure something like you can't be on a crashing or your house can't be on fire and then you call up your insurance company and you're like, I'd like to buy some fire insurance now. And they're like, wait, your house is on fire. They're like, yeah, well, no, I need it, right? No, it doesn't. insurance doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to buy fire insurance before your house is on fire, right? You understand that? Like once your house is on fire, that's the kill date, right? So there was a date where farmers could no longer buy crop insurance. And we hit that date. So I said, you know what? There's going to be a massive shortage of wheat in the fall. Now's the time to buy futures. Now, the funny thing is a lot of traders, the tr floor traders and stuff, they're sitting around using their GAN fans. Oh, what do I do now? Um, they don't understand the common sense of like, oh, farmers can't buy crop insurance. They probably won't plant this year. And if they do plant, despite not being insured, yields are going to be low. And you just people, a lot of people don't know these things. But I grew up in Saskatchewan. Yeah, I grew up in Saskatchewan. So these things matter, and it's it's common sense. And I try to surround myself um, with common sense. Common sense was really important as a venture capitalist. Common sense um, was um, very important to me when I was um, a high tech entrepreneur. Uh, or a uh, consultant for high-tech uh, companies, right? And common sense I found to be very, very uh, important in currency trading. Hang on, I got a sneeze there. No, oh, maybe not. Manny, my advice to you... Oh, thank you for subscribing. Many my advice to you as far as hedging, it's really not necessary. Um, if you're in a losing trade, Manny, be a man. Take the loss. Oh, is that right, Manny? Where'd you live? Okay. So, yeah, if you're in a bad trade, get the hell out of the bad trade. And, and because the other thing is, while you're messing around with your bad trade, you're missing like three or four good trades. So admit that you're wrong and get out before it's a bad loss. <laughs> yeah, be a money. Yeah. Okay, so don't even get in that logic of hedging. It's just a very, very bad habit, and one day it will ruin you, in my opinion. Regina, really? Boo. Yeah, I lived in Toontown for a while, and then I lived way up in <laughs> in Nowheresville. I, I lived uh, for a few years in a town with one streetlight. Here's an interesting story. So it had one street light. I would hang out at the 7-Eleven because that was cool. Um, I mean, imagine a town with one street light. Okay. And I was going to high school. And I'm an entrepreneur. Even then I was an entrepreneur. 
and I'm surrounded by rural Saskatchewan, living in a town of 5,000 people. Um, the town is so small that the school dress, the school bus driver, which is, of course, a cousin of a cousin of a cousin, because everyone was cousins, everyone were cousins, the school bus driver was an alcoholic and would bring a bottle of booze with him on the school bus. And everybody knew about it. <laughs> like, that's where I lived with those idiots. Holy shit. So here I am, maybe an intelligent young man, definitely entrepreneurial, living in a town like that. Like a living hell. And I love like opera and symphony and, and classical music and jazz. And I want to travel the world and I want to be a big businessman. And I live there. No classical music, no opera, no symphony, no world travelers, no, just cultural destitute and isolation. So this is, so five years later, I'm on the corner of, uh, was it Broad and Wall Street, uh, at the top of a skyscraper at a, uh, um, uh, Shearing and Sterling, I think it was a law firm, big, big New York law firm. I'm at a board meeting. I'm on the, on the, I'm on the board of directors for this corporation. I'm managing indirectly 3,000 people, but responsible for the entire Western United States, which was 12 offices, managing a, a staff. And on the board of directors is George Soros. Uh, not a bad swing for about five years, huh? It might have been seven years. But I was studying in that 7-Eleven, in that tiny little town with one street light. And I said, I'm going to get the hell out of here and I'm going to change the world. And no joke. Isn't it interesting? Five years later, I'm sitting on the board of directors of a corporation of thousands of people with George Soros. <laughs> That's a long way from that little town to 5,000 people. It can happen, man. If you make it happen, if you bend the will of the universe or bend the universe to, to your, with your will, you know, anything's achievable. Now, here's the interesting thing. You have this thing called Forex in front of you, and it's a tough gig, man. It is a tough gig. But it's supremely interesting. It's rarely boring. It's intellectually stimulating, right? And you'll get there. If you get rid of the whole get rich quick nonsense, and you focus on it like this is a business you want to do the rest of your life, you will be happy. You will be happy. Trust me, you'll be happy. But you got to get rid of all the amateur nonsense of, you know, getting your yellow Lambo and getting rich quick and easy money, quick money. That doesn't exist. Okay? It just just wipe it away from your brain. The the um, you know, the manipulators, you know, the Fed is a scam and you know, um, you know, everyone's hunting your stops and you know, all that just just erase it. Just it's a business. Five trillion passes through your laptop or computer every day. Five trillion dollars just floats through the air and through your MT4. Can you make enough money off of that flow to live? It's five trillion dollars a day, guys. Just always put it into context. It's not a video game. It's not a get rich. This is a real opportunity to absolutely change your life. And this is me telling you like a kid in rural Saskatchewan with nothing. And five or six years later, top of New York City, sitting on board of directors with George Soros. And you know what? I have traveled the world. I have done big, big business deals. Um, and it worked. It, I did I, I, I changed the universe, my universe, through just hard work and tenacity. You have that same sort of opportunity. Hard work and tenacity, 
with $5 trillion a day opportunity. You're not going to make $5 trillion a day, but as it floats past you, this money going to Australia, money going to Japan, as it's just floating by, can you just, can you get enough? And you're, and I don't want you to try to beat the market or to outsmart the market or use complicated math to impress the girls, I guess. Like, why do you, why would you use GAN fans and stuff, right? Make it simple. Just make it a business. Just sit down, do your job, don't do anything stupid, don't take any big risks, and think about being in the game a long time. How can you survive 10 years versus how can you get rich quick? Two different approaches completely, but I'm telling you, if you can get to year 10, you're going to be very, very, very happy. It's a, it, it's a business that you will own. You will own an income producing business and you can control everything. No accounts receivables, no accounts payable. You don't have to worry about should you use, you know, an accelerated depreciation or a straight line depreciation. Like, dude, dude, it's just money. It's liquid. Just enjoy it. There it is. You have this unbelievably amazing opportunity. Do you know how hard it is to get to the top of a board of directors in New York City and sit with George Soros? You might say to yourself, Lane, that doesn't sound like something I could do. I say, I get it. I got, I got, I somehow I got lucky or just somehow it happened. I don't know. But it happened. Or I, you're like, Wayne, I don't know if I can go, go to Harvard get a grad de graduate degree. I'm like, yeah, I get that. I don't know how it happened too. It's just, I don't know. It fell into my lap. I had an opportunity. I took it. Okay. But it's, it's very difficult. And then we look at this Forex thing in front of us. It's also very difficult, but you can do that. That is something you can do. It has nothing to do with who your dad was or what city you come from or what country you live in. You need skills and then you're going to need money. And here's the cool thing. If you don't have enough money, don't worry about it. Develop the skill stuff. There's so much money sloshing around the world that you, you will be able to attract over time, over the next 10 or 20 years you will be able to attract more money. People will be very, everyone I meet is incredibly interested in what I do. Every living soul I meet is very interested in what I do. Everyone wants to talk about it. It's like I'm a, uh, like a doctor at a party and everyone wants to show me their bunions. Um, I'm a currency trader. I go to parties. Everyone wants to talk politics and economics and the stock market and oil, gold, everyone wants, all of a sudden I have a crowd around me. They all want to smoke a cigar and talk business. This is what I do all day, but I love it. And they, But this is you, you can do this and you will be able to attract money because you'll be the smartest, best looking person in the room. And you'll be best looking because everyone thinks, man, that person is stellar. That person could make me money. If I had money, I would give them money. I see it in everyone's eyes. You get it? Like, that part will eventually be easy. You will earn the respect of everyone you meet. And they'll say, <laughs> And then you'll find the real challenge in Forex isn't money, it's managing clients. And then, then wait till wait till that happens. Talk about trader psychology. Wait till you, you start, you know, uh, managing the, the retirement of 50 people. And they're all freaking out, right? So anyways. Okay. You can do this, but... You, you need to do it right. You need to have the right focus. You have to have the right, have the right mindset. And the rest, man, oh. I have so many stories, like, we don't even have the time, but, like, I remember the first person I can take credit for truly helping. Um, 
she at first told me about her parents thought she was gambling and she wanted advice on how to tell her parents that she wasn't gambling. Right. And then she went on and made a lot of success. And here's how her story ended. Like I haven't talked to her ever since this was back in 2005 or something. Uh, she quit her job and here's the funny thing. She loved her job. So she and I had a few conversations about this. Like, she's like, Oh my God, I'm making like twice as much money at Forex than I am my job. And I might have to quit my job because I can't do, I, my job's now interfering Forex and I love my job, but like, I can't screw up this Forex thing because it's making so much money. Right? So eventually here's what she did. And this could happen to you. I know it's happened to multiple people. All these things that seem to be your goals now, like make a lot of money, for example, or make enough money to buy a better house, live in a better neighborhood, nicer watch, faster car, whatever your goal is, you'll, you'll achieve all of that. And then you'll be like, then what? So you'll have to create new goals for life. Like the petty goals of money just kind of disappear. So anyways, she quit her job. She bought her parents, uh, I think it was a, a Cadillac. Um, and then she moved to Korea to live with monks because she was Korean American, but had no Korean ties per se. Like she only knew Korean American culture. So she, it was a lifelong dream for her to connect with her Korean Pass or heritage. So she moved to Korea and sat with monks at the top of some mountain and joined some monastery and, and became Korean again. <laughs> like, no joke. Just had to redefine her life. And that was the first person. This is back 2005. So the goal here, Banda. I don't care if it's a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. The goal is to just make one or one somewhere between one and five percent a month. I don't care the amount of money; it's totally irrelevant. The money is irrelevant. Just produce the one to, to five. Five is pretty high. Every once in a while, in the right market conditions. Remember our conversation, alpha and beta. When beta allows for it, you'll do better than, than your normal, but that's not because of you taking more risk or something. And the market just gave. It's like a September often is a very good month like that. Okay. And then other months are not, not going to give as much, but your, your results are going to match the beta. You're not trying to outsmart the market guys. Okay. But it's the consistency. Okay. Is that, yeah, Jim, yeah, like Jim's one of my original guys. What was her name, Jim? Oh, I can, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, she was a nice person. But yeah, that's right. I, I, I forgot you go that far back, Jim. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I have like Natalie stuck in my mind. It's not right. Um, but yeah, what a nice person. Um, so yeah, like true story guys, like honest to God, true stories, right? So anyways, focus on just achieving 1% to 5% over a long period of time and money will find you. Okay. Money will find you guys. Don't worry about that. If you have the money as the focus now, and by the way, I'm saying this now as a Forex trader, but how many times have you heard this just in general, just in life, just in business practice? How many times have you read a leadership book that said, don't put the money first? Same thing. Yeah, well, th th those are old videos. Um, Actually, uh, here's the thing, going back to Michael. Michael, this was so long ago that the, this was before YouTube even existed. When YouTube came out, I was the first, like, 16 pages. If you typed in Forex, 
the first 16 pages of results, which what, 25 videos each, each page were a hundred percent. I was the only person in the world posting Forex videos on YouTube. So I'm talking, this is years before YouTube that I was doing this, uh, doing Forex trading. This was when Amazon.com was a tiny little internet startup that sold books online. And you type in Forex, one book would come up. Might be on FX Street. Well, even back then, FX Street, we, this was before webinars, really. I was really leading at that time doing webinars. If you remember my first FX Street stuff, it was chat. I did chat presentations. Because they didn't have webinars on FX Street. But I was doing webinars at FX Bootcamp using um, uh, Hotcom, I think it was. Like, this is so far back, guys. This was like caveman era. So will you be trading Forex that far out in the future? I really hope so. It's, it's worth the effort, guys. I want you to fight for it, but I want you to calm your brain down. I want you to not focus on more complexity or more tools, less tools, less complexity, and really, really, really focus on the long run. It, it's what changed my life, taking myself through my own performance coaching realizing like I found things like minimal acceptable performance from doing that. I found things like I do not need to take risk to get my returns. I took like stress off my shoulders uh, all through going through this analysis of my trading history and projecting into the future. And like I do for businesses and it, this business planning retreat I had with myself, um, at the Ritz Carlton in Half Moon Bay, California, when that was a brand new hotel, this business planning retreat with myself, um, was one of the best things I ever did in my life. It changed my life. Right. But I had to make it up on my own. Um, so all these things, simplicity, long-term, um, point of view, day by day by day focus. Right. You've heard the stories where I'd spend an, at least an hour a day doing analysis before I even opened my charts. Before I opened my charts, I already knew what I was going to trade and if I was a buyer or a seller. Then I would go and look at technical analysis to find the price. I already knew what I was going to do. I just didn't know the price. Because my trading platform and my charting platform were two different things because you couldn't get a trading platform with charts. That's how long ago this was, guys. Charts were separate. Your broker didn't offer you charts. You had to go to a charting company and pay them money. Like, you don't get how hard it was back then. The spread on the pound dollar was like, I think, I think it was like eight or nine pips. And the spread on the uh, pound yen was somewhere between 15 and 20 pips, right? So now you have this beautiful, mature market with all these resources, videos to watch, people to help, tools all integrated. I mean, we didn't even have the liquidity back then. Things would pop 300 pips in a minute. The first time I saw non-farm payrolls, it popped like 500 pips in a second. And the whole platform would freeze. Um, you have such a great foundation to build a fantastic lifelong business with low startup fees, no accounts receivable, no uh, accounts payable. And the taxation for a forex training business in the United States is so unbelievably favorable. It's like a gift. Like, I've analyzed thousands of business plans, no joke. And I invested into, well, exactly 100 patents. And the rest of my team, you know, my team and I, probably 300 patents. And I've read a thousand 
business plans, and I've helped raise millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars for other people's startups. There's nothing even remotely close as good as the opportunity you have in front of yourself. You just need to like double down, triple down, get involved, stay focused, have the right focus, and just do it. This is it. I, the, there is nothing better. There is nothing better. There is nothing better. Don't screw it up. Yeah, and I had a job because, right? I'm like, right? This is it. It doesn't get better. Don't screw this up. You want to get together tomorrow? I have a, an examination to take on real estate development. So I need to do some reading and stuff like that. You should include a beginner's guide in your packages of what and where to look for data for analysis. I feel like there's some, uh, yeah, yeah. We're actually putting that together, K-Star. Yeah. So anyways, I'm here every single day to help you. Um, there's also fxbootcamp.com where you can go for resources to help you. Um, you have a Trader's Way is a great broker that wants to take care of you. Think about it. They want these videos or these webinars provided to you in the hopes that you will succeed. Think of that. Just think of the mentality of a service provider that wants to make these investments up front and through through that earn your loyalty and respect and then hope one day you pay it back by opening an account to Traders Way. Just think of it like the mentality of their long-term focus to earn your loyalty and respect first up front and then hope that that provides you longevity and not just survival, but success as a client. Like, oh my God, you need that in your life. And if I'm wrong or if I, if I'm over preaching, then I apologize. So namaste, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. And uh, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. Thank you for leaving comments. I appreciate that, guys. And I will see you tomorrow. Giga, uh, if I'm, right, because of my workload, I'm more of a swing trader now. But I, I used to make, somewhere between 10 or 20 trades a day. And I was, my goal back then was to hold them as long as possible, usually. And there were times where I had more than 100 trades open. Because the only way you're going to make a lot of money is to let your winners run. Everybody knows that, right? Let your winners run. But, of course, very few people do it. Maybe 5%. And the other 95%, like, I don't know why people just struggle and try to scalp their way through Forex, making a quick buck, buy a yellow Lamborghini, Everybody knows the secret to success in trading is letting your winners run. Everybody knows it. And yet people want to scup, scup, scalp and get their yellow Lambo. And there's such a disconnect. But, but you know that the only way to make a lot of money is to let your winners run. So why do you do the opposite? Like, I don't understand. Like, why do people do the opposite and then think they deserve a yellow Lamborghini? Like, it's so stupid. I... I I don't understand like that. I don't understand why they don't understand. It's just it's so bizarro to me. Right? It's like, it's so weird. So I try to change that mindset. So I, I hope you get that and appreciate that. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for your time.